Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Uh, Teresa Lee Handy, and I started out as Jenkins. Um, Dr. Clay and I had a laugh about that uh, name change and, and school change in the middle of, since the beginning of the acceptance of this um, proposal for this presentation. So I first want to just recognize that our city was in trauma yesterday after a shooting at a high school of a, of a, a young teenage um, Black boy. And so I want us to hold space for him right now. And as well as I want to honor the fact that I sit on the land of the Chickasaw Nation. So I um, just want to take a moment uh, to make those acknowledgments and to share that with you all as I begin my uh, chat today with you. Um, it's uh, entitled Invisible in Plain Sight, the Lived Experiences of Black Female Graduates of P-12 Private Schools. This work sits on the, um, the arms of and the shoulders of Dr. Venus Winters, as well as um, Monique Morris. And so um, I'm grateful and appreciative of the work that they have done to support the work that I have tried to um, do for a very small uh, niche uh, group of uh, students. So uh, I'm going to um, stop sharing my video and focus on the, the work. And so our um, my agenda for today is really, uh, this started out as my dissertation research, of course. And so uh, it has now evolved into what my research interests are, which is specifically around black students in white spaces, focusing on classroom strategies, school support, remote and virtual support and stakeholder guidance. And that student is from the P-12 on to higher education, which is where I now sit. Uh, when I began this work, I was in the P-12 arena. Uh, I'm going to give you a background about the study, um, my data analysis process, the findings. Um, the most interesting piece of this that I did was the composite experience where I wrote a narrative um, highlighting um, all of the voices of the women um, in the study. Um, I thought I'm, I'm glad I don't have the full hour and a half, but I thought if I did, I would share some of that with you all. And I'm happy to do that um, at a later date if anyone is interested in doing that. Um, and then I also will follow up with some recommendations and what the future implications were for the study. So the purpose of the study was really to explore the private school culture and schooling experience of black female students at private schools. I wanted to reconstruct that experience specifically for black female students. And I wanted to then create um, what the essential qualities and experiences and features would be needed for a Black female in a private school. Um, this work is guided really by uh, my daughter, who is who has been a lifelong student at a private school in Memphis, where I, where I reside. And um, it all started when my son said to me, um, that was the worst, you know, I'm thinking I'm sending him to these, you know, private schools. And he said, that was the worst experience of my life, get Phoebe out of those schools. And so, um, it wasn't really an option um, based on the other schools that were available. And so I then sought out how do I create an environment that will help um, uh, support my daughter's racial identity. Um, and I was an educator at the school and I then became, I was the first black teacher they hired. I then became the diversity, equity and inclusion director, a position I created. And so this work um, was really undergirded by my real life experience as well. So my, these are my research questions. What is the nature and essence of the schooling experience of black female graduates? How do they speak of their experience? And then what, how do they describe these experiences of being racialized and or experiencing racism? Um, my foundation of um, my study, I did a deep dive into the literature, um, Howard Stevenson, Dr. Morris, Dr. Venus Evans Winters, all of the, you know, Dr. Fordham, there's just a lot of, there have been people out there doing this work um, for such a long time. And so having the opportunity to highlight it during um, a pandemic, you know, I finished my, my work right at the height of, of, of all of this um, that was evolving within our culture, right, and that within our society. And so it was um, rooted in understanding the unique school, unique private school experience, um, producing, trying to figure out how do I help these schools become critically conscious. Um, I used uh, six different theoretical frameworks because I couldn't find just one. And so there was all of the critical theories, critical race, critical race feminists, critical race school leadership, the Afrocentric model, the positive youth model, which is this fantastic program around helping um, develop racial identity within children. And of course, 
rooted in culturally responsive pedagogy. Um, I did a um, phenomenological approach along with the composite narrative, which is um, the story that I created from all of the voices with the main character being Phoebe, who is also my daughter. Um, so from all of that, I then created what I call the Black Girl Success Model. Um, in other words, for a Black girl to have success in these white spaces, it needs to be full, it needs to have a positive learning experience, it needs to create a confident student and to create a visible Black girl, what do we need to have? School culture needs to be critically conscious. The school culture needs to be affirming of her racial identity. There needs to be a very strong school home relationship. There needs to be a strong sense of belonging. It needs to be a community that identifies and supports her racial identity. And it needs to understand that the Black girls' school experience is unique. And to then, in the end, understand that any resistance they see to dress code and hair, to literature, any of the parents responding to, um, to things that are happening on the campus. It's not, um, those are not to be negatives that student resistance should be expected. And so this is just kind of the, um, all of the different frameworks that support these three key uh, traits that I think you need to have a confident student, visible black girl, the positive learning experience, all of these, you can see how they all have pieces, but not one encompasses all of them. So how did I even get to this? I um, looked for black female, gra I looked for graduates of private schools who identified as black female. It had to be a PTEL private school. And I'm happy to say that it was not a localized study. I had, I had over a hundred um, people to, um, con to respond to my, to my initial survey. And then from that, I pulled 12 and I interviewed them and they were from the West Coast, East Coast, North, South. And it was just a great mix of women to only discover that they all had a very similar experience. I did a semi-structured open-ended interview that the questions um, aligned with the theoretical framework and research, um, the, they aligned with the theoretical framework. Um, the, there was informed consent. The participant chose the location because we had, um, you know, because I have people all over the country, I did um, Zoom for most of them with one being in person. And so here is the analysis process. It was so, this was probably the most fun for me. And I'm sure those of you all who really get into qualitative research get this too. It's just the whole index card sorting and finding the themes. And I did not use a computer program. I used my own index cards and notes. And we, you know, the dining room table, the, the conference room table was just full of, it was just a really good experience to then be able to pull out those um, important elements. And here are just the elements that came out from each research question. So what is the essence of their experience? They experience alienation. Um, they, they desire acceptance. There's this lack of connectedness, a lack of sense of belonging, a lack of a support system. They deal with issues of classism, trauma, and isolation. And so here are the, some of the quotes from the interviews. Um, and I won't read all of them, but when you look at the alienation element, I'm 61 years old and I still remember that moment. You don't forget how people make you feel. And I think that person tried to make me, um, yeah, I think that person was trying to belittle me. I consistently felt left out. Um, that lack of connectedness. Um, one participant said, I just never felt that they had our best interests in mind. Even as a young person, you just felt like you were a source of revenue for the school. You didn't feel a connection with a large percentage of them. Um, I named all of the women, I gave them um, names of strong black women that identified with, uh, that I identified with. Um, the names of the, uh, in, the, in the composite narrative are just names of family members and cities that my father, who is now deceased, um, was able to um, incorporate all of those important pieces to me. So you don't see those names now, but you know, it was, um, it was kind of exciting to be able to put those connections to. Um, the trauma, my favorite teacher told me to stay after class and told me I was getting too big for my britches when all I did was speak up like the other students in class. The isolation, just not knowing where I fell in either one. And she was speaking to not knowing which group she fell into. Like, where do you win school? You know, where do I sit for lunch? Repeatedly, that was the conversation. One student in Ohio told me, one woman in Ohio told me that she was happy that her school had assigned seating. In fact, there were two schools out of the women that I spoke to that actually had assigned seating to help with this isolation. 
Research question number two, how do female, black female graduates speak of them? They speak of it um, as racialized spaces, spaces, alienation, and that their parents were oftentimes not aware of what was happening. When you think about racialized, the racialized spaces, we have the best education. I, I just learned so much and the exposure to different, to different people. Repeatedly, you heard this uh, appreciation of being of the access to a different community of people, the access to wealth that, um, but then you also felt the pain of having, um, you heard, I heard the pain of the, of what it felt like to be in those spaces. So they appreciated it, but they also felt a tremendous pain being there. Their parents, um, it's not like I could say, hey, I don't wanna go there. If she wanted you to attend private school, that's what you were going to do. And one person said, I wonder if my mom was ashamed of me for participating in that world. Like, I don't think she was prepared for that when she decided to send me there. There is this Tunis, and I talk about that a, a bit in my paper too, is, you know, this, the parents are wanting the best experience for their student, right, for their child, but they don't even know the culture of that school. And then not, she was, this particular person was speaking about a yard sale event at the school, and the parent, she, her, she felt her mother felt that she was embarrassed to be there because she didn't, she thought she may be seen as a visitor, not as a volunteer. It was a very complex situation. Um, and then the third question, how do black female graduates describe their experiences of being racialized or experiencing racism? The parental socialization, coping, surviving were the elements. And here are some quotes. Um, parent socialization was key to these students having at least a semblance of a, um, of a, of a sense of self and a, of, of their own racial identity. And parents, um, for example, this one woman said, my parents had me so grounded, it did not hit me about the class differences until I got out of school. My mother constantly told me who I was. That's how she grounded me. In my house, we talked about the riches of Africa. We didn't talk about slavery. And as a side note, I, as a DEI director at the school, I used to tell the, the white administrators and teachers were all surprised that I was angry that they talked about slavery in second grade and they want to talk about it in kindergarten. I said, listen, Black parents aren't having these conversations with their students at home, their, their children at home about slavery. We're trying to build our children up. We're not trying to tear them apart with this idiotic system that you all created. And they didn't seem to get it, but now they're a little more aware. And then coping. Um, you don't ruffle feathers, you live right, you act right. Whatever family values you have, you need to make sure that you are still parenting to them and giving them experiences. Meaning when a black student is in these white spaces, you do need to have enough of an undergirding of, of parental involvement and support so that your values are not lost as they are navigating those waters. And then resistance, surviving. This was a real big piece of, of the uh, experiences that I heard. Um, I did not involve my parents, I just handled it. I hear that from my own daughter who's a student. She handles the experience without involving me because she doesn't want me to come up and be angry. But then this week she said, mom, I need you to handle this because of a school photography issue where the lighting was not correct. And she came out looking even more brown than she is. And of course I handled it. And then they had the situation last week with rappers versus flappers where they were trying to do a homecoming thing. I said, that's inappropriate. So it turned into gowns versus clowns. So when they need us, they will find us. So the composite experience was really around picking up all of the uh, elements that I just mentioned and then sharing it as a story um, to then really highlight the themes that emerged. And it became Phoebe's story. And as I said, I'm happy to share that, um, that story because it was quite just a joy to write and then to share with my own daughter. So what is the significance of the story? The whole point was I was trying to help independent schools understand that they need to become critically conscious if they wanna keep students at their school, if they wanna bring students to their school, if they wanna retain them, and then they want to return as alumni who donate to the school as parents who want their children to go to that school. And to do that, you must have these, um, these three elements of your school culture. And it became very significant for me in working in Memphis and helping parents, uh, helping schools understand and navigate um, how they can recruit black families, especially as Tennessee is now opening up public school dollars for parents to use at private schools. So I look to um, 
I'm having fun with this research that I did in terms of just how how, you know, it's it's taking me places I never expected. Um, I see opportunities for, you know, dealing with gender issues. I did help my school navigate that. Um, and so I'm looking to um, for opportunities to help school, other schools navigate how they can create a critically conscious culture for their um, students. And those are my recommendations. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to um, share those with you. Can we ask questions? Oh, I may have said that wrong. Did I say that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Sure, of course. I thought this was really interesting. And I think until I heard everything that um, came out in your study, I didn't really recognize that I had this experience in college because mm. I went to a private women's college. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the experiences that you discussed here were actually what I experienced coming from public school and then going into that school setting. And so I wonder if you thought about how it might extend to students going to college, because a lot of the, the women who went to my college came from private schools and then went into that, that kind of replicated the private school. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you would say that because um, at my um, particular private school, most we have interesting a number of students go to HBCUs. I went to Spelman and I went to the University of Chicago and I so I have experience in walking in these worlds. And so um, I do see that as a possibility. Um, as I said, I am taking this work outside of, um, of the P12 network. So yeah, I definitely see that as, as um, a possibility. And I, I think it's interesting about the revelation that you had. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. My name is Erica. Um, I am actually a sociologist, and I am currently in Tennessee. Um, thank you so much for the talk, Dr. Larry. It was awesome. Um, I'm pretty interested in your work. I hadn't heard about it before, but um, I have a six-year-old that's currently at a private school here in Tennessee. Um, so this work is particularly interesting to me because of that. I'm also a, a Black Caribbean woman who came here and attended at HBCU in Nashville, Fisk University. Um, I just wanted to ask you um, if this work has been published and I'll probably email you to share your composite narrative with me. But um, can you tell me a little bit more about the 12 individuals, what the sample looked like? Because I, um, I could, you said one of them was 61, I saw that, but kind of like, what was the um, demographic characteristics of the sample, except for being wonderfully Black? <laughs> right, right. So when you think about segregation academies and when Brown versus, Brown versus Board of Education, when that happened, we had lots of private schools to create to you know to open because they were trying to keep black students from attending school with their children. So I interview people who graduate. I interviewed the very first black graduate of the private school where I worked. She graduated in 1968. And you have to understand this is even more significant to me because I was born in October of 1968, which is, you know, Dr. King was killed in, in April of 1968. So you I have this. 52 year life that kind of models what Dr. King was looking to have happen for his own children mm -hmm. as my own life. And then also I'm experiencing what it looks like post Brown versus board. And so when I interviewed, when I was looking for people, I didn't want the same age group, right? So I found, I interviewed the very first black female graduate of our school. And then I found one in Ohio, just so happens. And I was really happy that I had from 60 year old women to 22 year old women in the study. So I had a nice range of, and I kind of did my work by decades sometimes to help me see if there was any kind. And it was so disheartening to find out that my students in 2017 had the exact same yeah. classroom experiences as my first timers in 1968, right? It was like, oh, yeah. there was no, <laughs> I had, there were no glimmers of hope anywhere. Um, and it didn't matter with Florida, DC, mm -hmm. New York, Ohio, Oregon, Washington State, California. It did not matter where the school was. Where do you I think- I would be happy to speak so, with you. And I think, 
Do I have yeah. my information? Yeah, yeah I was just email. gonna say, Erica, if we can um, go ahead and move on. And um, there yeah. is one last question before we do move on um, of how you navigated the ethical issues of using your daughter as a participant. Um, and then we'll move on to um, Ronald's presentation. Right, my daughter was not a participant. She was in middle school at the time and I used her name with her permission as the uh, star of the story. Okay, and we'll save questions until the end because we are so pressed for time. And again, I apologize for all of the technical difficulties um, and appreciate the grace and patience that you all as participants have shown um, as we try to navigate through this. Um, so Ronald, I have your presentation and will now um, share my screen. <clears throat> All right, so thank you to everyone for your patience. Um, but I'll start by saying it's Friday. So that said, um, this presentation is entitled The Danger of Teaching Like a Champion for Black and Brown Students. Um, my name is Ronald Cunningham. I'm a dual degree student um, at both IU Robert McKinney School of Law and also IU PUI Purdue University's um, School of Education, a PhD student. Um, I'll save a bit in terms of getting to know more about who I am when I sort of reference my positionality. But in terms of opening, I think what I want to focus on for now is that the information that I'm going to share today represents a part of a broader interest that's going to define, that does define most of the scholarly work that I engage in. And at the center of the work that you're going to see here today is an interest specifically in schools of choice, in urban education, in teacher preparation, and most certainly in neoliberal education. But at the core of those intersections is one element, and that is Doug Lamoff's um, text, Teach Like a Champion. Um, I don't know that you can engage in any of those individual conversations without teach like a champion coming up. Um, this book was first published in the early 2000s. I think it was 2009 or 2010. And since that time, it's undergone at least two major updates, two iterations. There's a version 2.0 and I believe a 3.0 just came out fairly recently. Um, I think there's even another sort of a manual, if you will. But it is the standard for what urban classrooms should look like. Um, and I use that term urban classrooms loosely, and I use the term standard loosely. Um, so that said, let's move on to our second slide. So this presentation is focused very exclusively on evaluating Doug Lamar's work. Um, I employ three forms of critical thought, critical race theory, critical discourse analysis, and critical race spatial analysis. And that's supported with John Hattie's zone of desired effects. While John Hattie doesn't fit into that sort of critical space in terms of a framework, um, if you're in urban education and looking at um, sort of performance indicators. I don't know that you can do that without having some discussion of John Hattie. Like he, he sets that standard quite a bit. So I use him to evaluate quite truthfully the effectiveness. Um, and ultimately my, my outcomes emphasize the fact that we need to apply an evidence-based and a critical approach to any and all policy and practice-based decisions. Um, there is value but the application of these practices um, to say problematic is probably a bit of an understatement. Um, and I wanna focus and center us very clearly in a statement from Hattie. Um, the focus on instructional practices deemed best practices should extend learning beyond what a student can achieve by simply attending school for a year. In other words, best practices, and we can move on to the next slide, best practices, best practices, best, best practices. I wanna emphasize very heavily that that is at the core of this conversation. Um, I live in both higher ed and K-12 spaces, and I find that it is particularly in K-12 spaces, one of the most 
overused and misunderstood terms. And I would argue that in the case of Doug Lamov and Teach Like a Champion, that is 100% the case. So if we're going to talk about what best practices are, Hattie makes clear to us that best practices should be something that is consistent and it lives beyond the confines of a very narrow space. Um, the evidence doesn't support that these are best practices because a lot of the benefits does not seem to live beyond a year or two of student growth. So that is very much what has motivated this, this sort of investigation. Um, and so if we look at the next slide, um, I find it really important to emphasize my positionality because it serves as an introduction to who I am. Um, and I wanna challenge any of those sort of expectations that there's no value associated with this process. Um, I am unashamedly um, a black male educator. Um, I can't not be, and my lens is always colored in that way. So rather than look at this as desiring to be unbiased, I am happily biased. Um, and I just seek to figure out how that bias informs all of my work. Um, I've worked in K-12 education. This is probably about year 23 or so for me. I've worked indirectly and directly with more than 20 organizations in six different states, um, including the District of Columbia. So literally from one end of the country to the other. Um, I'm a currently an instructor in a university educator program. So I get to experience this as a K-12 educator, um, but I also get to experience the aftermath and what this looks like in a teacher training program. Um, I also wanna emphasize that of those 23 years or so, I've worked in a number of schools that were Teach for America sort of schools. Um, and I don't think you can say Teach for America without saying KIPP schools. Um, I've also worked in schools that are maybe not, they don't articulate that they're either, but they're clearly Teach Like a Champion based schools. Um, and by that, I don't think that you can talk about any charter school um, that is rooted in an urban setting that doesn't have an awareness of Doug Lamont and Teach Like a Champion. So again, in terms of my positionality, I bring all that into this study that I'm sort of sharing today. So if we move on to the next slide, I wanna emphasize Lamont's major claim. One more, there we go. Um, Lamont's claim is that the strategies, the techniques in this text the techniques close the achievement gap for college readiness. And I wanna emphasize that statement that they close the achievement gap. He roots that growth in the fact that the teachers um, who utilize these strategies, um, these teachers whose students came from poverty and dealt with the associated challenges such a demographic implied. So essentially what he's stating is that this is the answer. Whatever the problem is in urban education, in terms of instruction, in terms of student achievement, this is the answer. So these strategies close that gap and he grounds, or he justifies his, his sort of action, his sort of use of these strategies in his belief that these are strategies that were used in urban, for urban students by the teachers who directly taught them. That's important. Because if that's the standard that he's using, then that's the standard whereby we should be evaluating him. So let's move on to the next slide. So I want to make sure that we're clear about where this lies. Um, there are a number of educational corporations nationwide that benefit and are grounded and invested in Teach Like a Champion. Um, most notable among them would be Teach for America, the Knowledge is Power program, otherwise known as KIPP, Uncommon Schools, and the Relay Graduate School of Education. There are other examples. I chose to focus on these because these all have nationwide presence. Um, where I'm currently located in Indianapolis, in the sort of Midwest area, um, a regional agent would be the Mind Trust. There are other sort of variations throughout the country, but each one of these entities has a national presence. 
And so if we're going to talk about Teach for America, I'm sorry, if we're going to talk about Teach Like a Champion, um, we need to make sure that we understand where that's situated, because this is very much um, a neoliberal conversation. This is very much about um, this is very much about how white neoliberals frame their version of how to address and to fix and to correct what they perceive to be wrong in urban educational settings. And the authors of this, this behavior, they're posted right here. And I wanna make sure we, we name them and I wanna make sure we're clear about the impact that they have. So Teach for America currently has a membership of more than 7,000 um, with more than 55,000 alumni. KIPP currently has roughly 250 middle and high schools across the country, consisting of more than 100,000 students. Um, and through their funding with the Charter School Growth Fund, this organization is situated to create their, recreate their model in six additional districts. Um, Uncommon Schools consists of 53 institutions and roughly 20,000 schools or 20,000 students. Um, and this includes being present in two of the largest school districts in the country. Um, and finally, Relay Graduate School of Education is probably the newest on this list. Um, but the Relay Graduate School of Education or interact, I should say alumni, graduates of the Relay Graduate School of Education interact daily with more than 400,000 public school students across the country. Why am I saying all this? Because each one of these agencies, Teach for America, A Common Schools, KIPP, Relay Graduate School of Education, they make required in their training, in their teacher development, that they all center themselves in Doug Lamov's framework of teach like a champion. So this is not only the fundamental for how we train and prepare and support and evaluate teachers, but this is a moneymaker for a massive white neoliberal so-called change agent within education. We need to name that. Um, so we can move on to the next slide here. So my research question, should all instructional practices promoted by this text be classified as effective and should they all be classified as best practices? Lamar would have been better, he would have been better prepared. He would have been more successful had he emphasized that some were more effective than others. But to make the statement that all of these practices, that's a very meaty statement. And he's essentially saying that all of these practices are effective and best practices. I want to question that. Next, do all of these practices align with measurable learning outcomes that promote what we consider to be culturally competent instruction? So those two guiding research questions are what fueled this, this project that I have here. We can move on. So I want to center this also in Paolo Ferreira um, again. Um, he I don't know that we can talk about critical pedagogy. I don't know that we can talk about criticality without bringing up Freire. And so I shared these two quotes to emphasize that this is by no means, while I am naming white neoliberal action, I don't want to make the work that actually occurs to be a matter of black and white. Instead, this is really an issue of whiteness and blackness. In other words, we can have white bodies that question those sort of racist, um, white, the sort of white supremacist values. And conversely, we can also have black bodies that buy into these sort of notions of whiteness. So this isn't a black person, white person sort of outdated sort of question or conversation. These are instead issues of whiteness and blackness. And so with that said, I just wanna remind us of the foundation of what Paolo Ferreira has shared with us. So in, in his text, um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he shares essentially that oppressed people don't necessarily wanna, they don't, because of the way that we have been trained, the goal of oppressed people is very rarely for us to end oppression. And that's a sobering thought, but I wanna push it out for everyone to consider. Freire challenges us and, and asserts essentially that 
the goal of oppressed people is for them to simply stop being oppressed. And because we have been so immersed in oppression, um, we end up oppressing others. But the goal of oppressed people is oftentimes to not to eliminate oppression as a, as a reality, but for us to simply not be oppressed. And I bring that up because we see evidence of that throughout Lamov's practice of Teach Like a Champion. We have individuals who have been oppressed throughout their educational experiences and are now authors and agents of an oppressive sort of instructional strategy. The next slide I wanna talk about um, challenges us to look at this sort of neoliberal project. So part of this neoliberal project is the manufacturing of these discourses that work to normalize this social arrangement and construct them as simply the way things are. If I have to hear one more K-12 educator say best practices and the research says, it is the most exhausting and damaging sort of rhetoric that I think I've ever heard. And to be quite frank, K-12 educators do, do a really poor job of managing this dialogue. In other words, is it in fact a best practice or is it a commonly used practice? What I'm suggesting through my evaluation of Lamar's text is that not only does Lamar's test not sort of pass the or meet that standard of being a best practice, but it is being promoted through this sort of neoliberal thought process as something that is best practice when it doesn't meet that standard. And so now we saw, so we've normalized that process. So if we can move on. So in terms of framing the question and my methodological perspectives, I employ three different areas of critical theory. The first of which is critical race theory. While there's several key tenets, the two that I focus on specifically are the critique of liberalism and interest convergence. Um, we understand, and, and Derek Bell, who is the father of critical race theory, tells us that what interest convergence shows is that when there are successes that Black people experience, those successes are oftentimes allowed when white America, the, the values of white America and the values of Black Americans converge. So for example, I think it was Dr. Handy who referenced the um, Brown v. Board of Education. While Brown v. Board of Education was a game changer, this, this played a role in ending segregation to what degree were, was white America in a position where the end of segregation was a benefit to them as well? So Derek Bell asserts that when interests converge, that is where black Americans have seen a significant amount of progress. And that's a concept that I wanna bring into this conversation because in what ways does improving education for black students benefit white educators? And that's a question that white neoliberals are sort of mixed up in because instead of trying to end the disparity in education, critical race theory helps us understand that white neoliberals don't appear to be invested in ending this disparity. Rather, they are capitalizing, they are profiting off of it. And instead of working themselves out of a job, they are making sure that that condition exists because they're building careers off of it. In the case of Doug Lamov and Teach Like a Champion, he has created a thriving corporation throughout this country. Critical discourse analysis is important because critical discourse analysis allows us to look or forces us to look at the, the sort of linguistic practices and look at those ways in which it focuses on the social realities where hegemonic ideologies and equitable distributions of power are sustained or hidden by language. So it really allows us to emphasize and talk about this notion of best practices. <clears throat> and lastly, critical race spatial analysis is extremely important. That's another framework and methodological approach that accounts for the role that race, racism, and white supremacy plays in specific spaces, but identifying where they are located. The reality is that critical race spatial analysis helps us understand that if these are in fact best practices, why do they only exist in schools where we are 
where we see black and brown students. If these are in fact best practices, these practices should exist in the best schools. The reality is that predominantly white school and high performing schools, not only are they aware of these practices, they are vocal in resisting these practices. So we need to question whether or not they are in fact best practices. I would challenge anybody in this space who is in an urban space or an urban setting, which is probably all of us, to look at the schools in our own district and ask, where do we see these? We see these in schools where the majority of the population of students are black or brown students. But when we go uptown, where we see predominantly white students and where we see the more privileged spaces, and certainly, I don't know that there's a private school on planet Earth that utilizes any of these strategies. So how does that notion of best practices apply when it's limited and restricted to spaces where there are only black and brown students? Um, we can move on to the next slide. So the review of the literature was quite revealing as well. So if this is, given the impact that Lamov's text has on education, I found fewer than 20 scholarly sources that explicitly even named Teach Like a Champion. Um, the most notable examples would have been Julian Vasquez Helix. So I'm sure several of you, most of you are familiar with him. I think he just relocated and he's now a Dean at um, University of Kentucky. Um, he is a fervent critic of Teach for America. Um, he has referenced, he's mentioned Teach Like a Champion, but I'm not aware, I haven't seen where it has been the central focus of a scholarly work. He's mentioned it in a number of his articles, but it hasn't been the focus of his study. Um, I saw another piece by Leila Chuhath Dali, where Teach Like a Champion was the focus of the work, but that work doesn't rise to the level of being scholarly. It was not peer reviewed. So the question is, why is it, given the impact of Teach Like a Champion, that this text has not undergone any sort of thoughtful scrutiny? Why is it that this work, these strategies that are so highly influential, they've never been the focus of a peer review scholarly article. Anytime it has been referenced in an article, and I'm referring to the majority of those 20 scholarly articles I'm listing here, it's sort of mentioned, but it isn't the central focus. So this work attempts to make um, a contribution to that in that Teach Like a Champion is the focus of this work. And my goal is once I've sort of completed my analysis and evaluation to submit it so that it is um, open for peer review and publication. We can move on to the next slide. So Hattie's zone of desired effects is hugely important. So the short of it is that John Hattie um, employs um, these effect sizes on environmental influences within the teacher's domain. So essentially, you have an effect size as a means of measuring influence. So an effect size that is greater than zero has a positive impact on student learning. An effect size that is less than zero has a negative effect on learning. Some examples, summer vacation has an effect size of negative 0.02. So that has a detrimental learning impact as opposed to group learning. Group learning has a positive 0.49. So what that's telling us is that, and, and I, want, I wanna emphasize that this obviously, this range is extremely small, but what this is saying is that if we evaluate each of these variables, it can help determine whether or not these actions have positive and negative effects on learning. Part of my critique has involved me applying each one of Doug Lamont's Teach Like a Champion um, strategies to these sort of um, effect sizes. And the range has been pretty vast. We can move on to the next slide. So my recommendations are that schools employ teach like a strategy or schools that employ these strategies exercise extreme caution against this excessive reliance that's placed on Lamar's system, particularly when it's designed to serve as a solution to challenges faced by oppressed people. There is value to some of the strategies that Lamar suggests, but a blanket sweeping 
um, recommendation to all settings, to all students, to all manner of students does not appear to be beneficial. My second rec recommendation is that we really ought to apply a broader social context to the use of Lamont strategies. What are the implications of some of those strategies? One of the criticisms, which seems valid, is that a lot of these techniques serve to control black and brown bodies. They focus on movement, but do they specifically speak to mastery of student content? Or are we simply saying by controlling black and brown bodies, that equates to student achievement? My, my final recommendation is that we really need to challenge the belief that all of these challenges are, or techniques, I'm sorry, are appropriate for all groups without weighing the possible harms. Let's move on to the next slide. So some of the key findings, CRT helps us understand that Teach Like a Champion benefits white neoliberal educators and educate, educator corporations because they specifically profit from students of color. As educators, our job should really be, particularly when we are in, in schools of reform, the goal should be to work ourselves out of a job. If you're really invested in reform and growth, the goal is for you to contribute to that growth in a way that you're no longer needed. That is not the approach here. There seems to be an investment in a long-term need and that yields financial benefits. And that speaks directly to the white neoliberal presence throughout this text. Um, so rather than genuinely seek to improve the quality of urban education, these individuals are making a career out of that disparity and they profit financially from these conditions. Um, second key finding, critical discourse analysis really helps us see that Lamov doesn't qualify any of his problematic language around poverty and privilege. There is value to these teach like a champion strategies, but Hattie's zone of desired effects helps us understand that the value um, differs from strategy to strategy and that it does not necessarily apply or fit all environments. The combination of critical race theory and critical discourse analysis along with Hattie helps us understand and see how Lamov does not measure the effectiveness of each individual technique so much as he endorses this sweeping or he promotes this sweeping endorsement of all of the strategies in the text. And lastly, critical race spatial analysis helps us recognize that these strategies are reserved for students of color. As I mentioned earlier, these strategies are not present in predominantly white schools. And for that matter, I would include um, Asian schools. They are not present in high performing schools, but they seem to be reserved where they are students of color and specifically black and Latinx students. Um, that said, I think that is my last slide of content. Um, I'm open for any questions. And I hope that that was both clear and helpful to everyone. We actually um, still have uh, Janice and Natasha who are supposed to present, but obviously gotcha. we are uh, running very close to time. Uh, um, I, again, I apologize for the challenges we've had in this session. Um, Janice, Natasha, do you want to try to um, share a synopsis? Again, I apologize for the challenges we faced in this session. We will try. I know it's difficult, but I appreciate you doing so. Do you want me to share the slides? Yes, please. It's not working. <sighs> All 
So in the interest of time, we won't say what the title is because I'm assuming you can read. I'm not assuming, I know you can all read. So we would like to start in true African tradition with our libations, which we would have liked to take you through if you were present. And we call on the ancestors to be ever present and to look over us as we share with you our experiences of doing evaluation. We were giving you a minute to read the indigenous land acknowledgement, but in the interest of time, we move on. So the overarching question we asked in this session is how we, how have we as evaluators with a commitment to cultural responsiveness been able or not able to avoid being yet another colonialist? Why do we do that? Primarily because the context within which we're doing this work, of course, informed the frames that we used. And this was an NSF funded SS STEM program designed to do something for students who were considered high achieving and therefore in this minority serving institution that we work, here we have these underrepresented high performance students being given a chance to develop in a certain way. So what do we do as we apply for this funding? You have to also understand that Natasha, Suzette, who's not here, and myself are three women from the Black dia from the diaspora who are now working with an evaluation unit in which I don't think there's anybody from the Black diaspora. And if there is, I'm sorry if I left you out. And other mentors and faculty at the university who are supporting and working in the STEM. But we are in the social sciences and they are in the STEM. So here you have that collaboration and that opportunity for us to, you know, kind of work with them and build relationships. So what have we done? Tash, take it. Okay. So what we did, we collected three years of survey data on student experiences in the program, and that was connected to the theory that we showed you in the previous slide. And then we also, uh, through the surveys of current participants, we examine, or sorry, actually through the interviews of current participants, we examine participants' perspectives via phenomenological, phenomenological exit interviews with graduate students. And then we worked with the external evaluation team to collect and analyze data, provide an evaluation report for the four-year grant funded program. So for the student surveys, uh, we sought to measure specific outcomes of the program, confidence and self-efficacy, uh, self-confidence, retention, graduation, employment opportunities, and representation. So each semester, the students were sent a survey via Qualtrics that was um, already valid and reliable in terms of measuring all of these outcomes. And they would take that survey to give us a sense of how that was changing over time. So the data we have shows um, that they actually did increase over time. But in terms of student interviews, the interviews were our push back and push out is how we call it, um, which was basically letting us look at how this process um, was affecting students individually and the meaning that making um, process of their experience. And so as the researchers, we were outside of the STEM program and meaning that uh, really it was the faculty who run the program and um, Dr. Suzette Mooring, who's the director of the program, who kind of shaped the curriculum and work with the students. We mainly observed and collected the data and um, conducted the interviews um, in that space. But I think it's how we did it that made the difference, right? So we were critically reflecting on, you know, and I think we have to fast forward to this whole conference, which allows us to even do that much better. What, what it is to be, so yes, Tash, you could go to the last slide because we don't have okay. to. What, what we're asking is to be or not to be, right? So as, as evaluators and researchers in the social sciences, what are we doing? How important it is for us as researchers in social science field to interrupt rather than perpetuate systems of power that are marginalizing. So the best way we could do that is through that collaboration, that building of trust, that reciprocity between the groups and to kind of allow them to learn from us 
because they don't, they're not coming with that. What we're taking home, as, as I like to talk about it, is a group of white men. We're taking them home with us. We're taking their theories home with us. So how do we push back against that? What do we do? What can we do? And, and the question we ask, Tasha and I, is, is it enough to just boast about how much money the colleges and faculty are bringing in to raise the status of the institution? Yes, that money is being used to support the minor, support these high achieving minoritized students, but is there more to it than just that? And we see our role as bringing that conversation to the grant funders. And I was really happy to see Nyla yesterday and to realize we have advocates like Nyla Nasi, who is now in those kind of grant funding spaces, which will then allow us to have a more asset and equity-based discussion about evaluation and research as it relates to these fund, these large grant funding projects. So what are we going to do? So the question we ask is, where do we or can we get the courage to speak out and push back against the practice of just following the money? and not ensuring that the institutions value the outcomes of these evaluations and do things differently based on the outcomes. So, oh, we are seeing and we are hearing the students say, oh yes, we, if we didn't have this funding, we would not be able to complete, we wouldn't be able to continue with careers in STEM and that kind of thing. But are we encouraging those same students to not, as they said, when they, they are hoping they could come back and give back. But what about the students who, weren't as high achieving as they were, and were never able to get into the STEM programs. How are we using this, this context to you know, facilitate their going back to their K-12 schools and doing something to support? So the support I am arguing should not just be for these high achieving so-called minoritized students, but we should be giving something to them, some kind of knowledge so that they too feel a sense of responsibility to go back. And so the last question is what role do conferences like this one and the dialogues playing out and expanding our mind bodies and pushing us to think about what we do differently. And I'm saying to Tasha and I, having done this reflection and prepared for this session, which we couldn't share all of it because of circumstances, but we understand how did that help us to really look at what, what does it mean to be a culturally responsive evaluator in a situation where we are depending on the funds on one hand to do the work, but on the other hand, are we being colonizers ourselves while we do this kind of work? Are we conscious and mindful of the kind of work we are doing? How are we building relationship and showing respect for these students who, you know, because of the money, we have a relationship with them and it's almost, according to my watch, 1120 something. So I'll pause. Janice, Natasha, thank you so much for sharing what you could of what seems like a great research project. And I, again, I apologize for um, all of the circumstances that led to your abbreviated presentation. Um, hopefully the participants can connect with you all to get more information about um, the topic and the research that you all um, tried to share with us. Appreciate your understanding and for everyone in the session. Thank you so much for joining us um, and hopefully you'll enjoy the rest of the day.